Hi everybody, I'm Brent Stafford and welcome to RegWatch special coverage of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, Good Cop, Bad Cop, the counter conference to COP10, the World Health Organization's Conference of the Parties to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, happening this week in Panama City, Panama. And uh, for something a little special, we're going to start off with an interview and we have today joining us Dr. Constantinos Farsalinos. How's it going, doctor? Hi, Brent. Nice to, to speak with you again. So you're a cardiologist and you're based out of Greece. Why don't you fill our viewers in quickly about your experience in terms of e-cigarette research? Well, I think it's enough to say that I have more than 100 publications in the scientific literature since 2013 concerning smoking harm reduction, particularly electronic cigarettes, but not only even heated tobacco products. So I think that speaks enough on my um, expertise in the subject. Well, you certainly uh, know what you're talking about. Now, tell us, are e-cigarettes safer than smoking? There is, there is no doubt about it. I mean, we have so many years of uh, evidence, and evidence is growing uh, every day on the lower uh, risk potential of these products that I don't think there should be a debate today. Uh, we should be debating on why some authorities, and I'm talking about the WHO, FCTC, and some countries which have been deceived, I must say, from the WHO, by the WHO, why they are following a, an approach which is risk aversive, which accepts zero risk, and which has, uh, which is completely unrealistic. Uh, you know, it's like trying to address the problem of traffic accidents and accept as the only approach that no person should ever enter a car. Uh, you understand how unrealistic that is, uh, because people need the cars in the same way that people need pleasure and some people cannot um, um, avoid having a pleasure of using nicotine or inhaling something. And when you uh, simply cancel any other approach like seat belts, like driving carefully, like being well educated before you get a driving license, by using the argument that, oh, there is some residual risk to that, despite being a good driver, despite driving with a seatbelt, you still have a risk of being injured in a car crash. So we don't accept that. We can only accept not ever entering a car. You understand that we're talking about an unrealistic strategy coming from people who probably live in another world or uh, simply dream of a world that will never exist. Because in our daily lives and in all our activities, there is no zero risk. You know, harm reduction for smoking is not different from harm reduction when you want to cross the street and you look on your left and on your right before crossing the street. That's exactly what harm reduction is. And despite harm reduction being acceptable everywhere and in all our activities, it's smoking where it is not accepted at all, which doesn't make sense. The WHO, the NFCTC, in my opinion, have become uh, anti-nicotine. They have engaged into a, an anti-nicotine crusade. They exhibit intense nicotinophobia. That's how I can call it. And the, the problem is that they cause harm to the people, particularly to smokers. You know, the WHO, some people think that the WHO can never be wrong. Well, they were wrong 40 years ago with their drug war. And the drug war and their policies against drugs cost lives at that time. Uh, several thousand of people died because of the bad policies of the WHO. But at that time, it affected about 20 million intravenous drug users globally. Today, the mistakes of the WHO affect 1.2 billion people. So beyond any certainty, it's absolutely certain that the, the cost of lives of these bad decisions is much higher than the cost of lives at that time with the failures in the uh, drug uh, policy uh, of uh, the WHO. Dr. Farsalinos, would you say, is it accurate to comment that WHO officials are ignoring science? They're absolutely ignoring science because the basic principle in science is that you have to look at the totality of evidence. It's not my quote. Richard Feynman uh, was saying that the famous Nobel laureate uh, that 
Science is the belief in the ignorance of the experts, and you should always be critical towards science and look at the totality of evidence. What we are seeing from the WHO is cherry-picking studies uh, that uh, fit to the agenda, to their prohibitory agenda. And unfortunately, I must say that what we are seeing is not using science in order to make decisions about public health, but using science, parts of science, in order to support predetermined decisions and already made decisions, and then using that part of science that fit our own decisions uh, in, uh, in, in a way of providing an argument uh, to support uh, what uh, we are suggesting. Um, the problem is that today, after so many years, several countries have fell into this, let's call it in quotes, trap of the WHO. They have made pretty bad regulatory decisions and they are paying the price every day. And I'm going to give you one characteristic example. One characteristic example is India, which was congratulated by the WHO for the decision to ban e-cigarettes. What has happened over, after the ban? The e-cigarette market skyrocketed, multiplied by several times, but it is 100% black market of illicit products that no one knows where they're made, no one knows how they're made, what they contain, there is nothing. And what the Indian government did, which is even stranger, they also banned research on harm reduction products. And I think it's very easy for someone to understand why they did that. Because when you look at the outcome that I just mentioned of this decision, now imagine to have science present this highly adverse outcome of their decisions and present them publicly into the country. They wouldn't like that. And that's why I think it's pretty clear that the reason why they decided to not only ban the products, but ban scientists from doing any kind of research on the products. Yeah, it's very troubling, isn't it? And uh, do you get a sense, obviously, that you and ev all the other people there at the Good Cop, Bad Cop are not welcome in Panama? Well, obviously, we're not welcome because whenever we attempt to engage into a debate with uh, these officials, but with other also public health experts, we have failed miserably. And you need to understand that we are in favor of a debate because being in a panel where everyone agrees is not very productive. What is productive is to have disagreement, explain and present all the arguments from both sides. And then, believe me, it's going to be very easy for the majority to understand what's happening. When you only see separate monologues from one side or from the other side, then I think that it's very difficult to, uh, to, have, uh, uh, to make any decision and to understand what's happening. And I must emphasize, it's not us who avoid the debate. It's the other side, unfortunately, which is continuously over many years avoiding this debate. Now, I know that you have to go, so I have just one quick question uh, for you before you know we end this, and that is, do you think we're going to see restrictive policies, like m more restrictive policies coming out of the WHO on, say, nicotine vaping products? Well, I think that this is their goal, and I think that this is what they're trying to do, and they have many tricks up in their sleeves to, to do that. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, because, as you know, with the FCTC, you have... To, they must make unanimous decisions. I don't know if some countries can really stand up uh, for harm reduction. I hope they do. Uh, the best thing that we can wait, we can expect is just um, not make any further decisions. Other than that, with the current uh, prospects and the current environment within the WHO, any decisions are going to be bad decisions, in my opinion. And just one, sorry, one more last one. Were you disappointed with the UK's decision to ban disposables? Oh, yes, I think it's a step back. Uh, it's a step back from a country which has been a, a pioneer in harm reduction. Not only that, but they have also seen the results of their approach. So we are now evaluating already the results of this approach. There is no uncertainty. The UK, as well as New Zealand now, as we see the latest data, have been very successful, and they were successful by incorporating harm reduction into their anti-smoking policies. Um, making step backs, 
I think it, it, it creates a precedent for other countries, unfortunately, to follow. And uh, I think it will also be a step back for harm reduction in the UK itself also. It's a real shame. Dr. Farsalinos, thank you so very much uh, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there we go. Hey, we're back with uh, Dave Williams, the president of Taxpayers Protection Alliance and Martin Cullop, international fellow, longtime friend of the show. Gentlemen, how are you both doing? Doing good. Day two and still have a lot of energy up uh, for a good cop. Yeah, I've been having some good conversations today, moderating some panels with some some great guests. Yeah. Well, that's good to new Good news. Good to hear. So how are we going to start this, Martin? I'm not sure yet if you've received any of those bulletins or journals or whatever. I know that there is kind of some updates. Why don't you fill me and the audience in on on that? Yeah, we've had the first journal um, uh, since the opening plenary, and, and it set out what's happening today. Uh, committee B, because they split after the open plenary into Committee A and Committee B. Committee A uh, deals with structural matters and, and budgets and, and you know, organisational stuff. Committee B talks about policy. So Committee B today was scheduled to talk about Article 9 and 10, uh, which is to do with uh, contents of, of products and emissions and, and controls and stuff. Uh, we know they're going to try and um, bring these uh, bring reduced risk products into those into those articles uh, so we keep a watch on that but more sinister is that they're they're uh, giving the parties to the convention reports that they compile we've seen the reports they've been published um, and these are the ones where they they have their cherry pick science that Konstantinos was just talking about where they exclude Cochrane reviews for example and, and then claim that e-cigarettes cannot uh, are not proven to help people quit smoking and where they uh, ignore things like the Office of Health Improvement Disparities report, that, that which used to be PHE, who in 2022 produced 1,468 pages to say that you know there's little chance of um, uh, of the future showing much harm from from vaping products. And by excluding that, then they say you know that we do not know have enough information and no long term data, and and that is where they try and apply the precautionary principle on the back back of that. So if you ignore certain scientific um, uh, studies, and they are good ones, they're, they're well, well, well written ones, then obviously you can come out with policies and say we should ban these products or treat them the same as cigarettes. And that's the subterfuge and, and the, um, the conniving way that the WHO is acting to try and treat safer products the same as cigarettes. David, um, you're the color man here for the broadcast. What do you make of all this? Well, this is really what we expected, right? Is that we would see uh, the phony science, the bad science. And, you know, when I hear Martin talk about this, <clears throat> obviously I get very frustrated because we hear about the real world experience of consumers. These are the folks that, you know, have been smoking cigarettes their whole life and they found one of these products, whether it's heat, not burn, whether they're vaping, snus, you name it, they found one of these products and it has literally saved their lives. And that's what the World Health Organization needs to hear from. Are these consumers, the people's lives that they are saving and completely changing? And if you look at, uh, you know, ICOS, this heat not burn product uh, was introduced in Japan a number of years ago, and they've seen a, de uh, a drastic decline in heart disease. 
and it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that's happening in Japan. And it's, um, I think they have like 10 to 11 or 12 percent adoption of ICOs in Japan and some countries. And we're seeing the health effects of it. And that's what blows my mind as a taxpayer and consumer advocate is this taxpayer funded organization is not working on behalf of taxpayers or consumers. And, you know, Brent, it's something that I, t I talk about actually a lot with this is my dad smoked three and a half packs of cigarettes a day for 20 years. He died because he smoked too much. He didn't have access to these products. I wish I had a time machine and I could take one of these products back to the 70s, give it to my father and say, here, do this instead of smoking. He would wake up. The first thing he did was grab a cigarette and he would smoke it and he would fall asleep with a cigarette in his mouth. And I remember visiting him at work um, and he'd have two cigarettes. He'd be smoking two cigarettes at a time, which obviously was frustrating. But that's what I'm getting frustrated about. You know, on day two of COP is that they're behind closed doors and they're missing the point here. They're missing the point of why they should be meeting is for advocating for consumers, not for the bureaucracy. Right now they're advocating for the bureaucracy and not consumers. Yeah, it's quite maddening. Um, and I've gone back, uh, we've got a couple of clips here today for us to go through. I've gone back to that maximizing transparency and bolstering Article 5.3, which the FTC, FCTC held on January 24th. We played some clips of it yesterday. Um, and as well, Martin uh, commented about, and so did you, about how they went after Taxpayers Protection Alliance, as well as Knowledge Action Change as harm reduction front groups it's you know i mean it's it's embarrassing if it wasn't so treacherous actually so here's a clip that we've got but i want to very quickly touch on the full coverage of article 5.3 guidelines so, you know, whom does the guidelines apply to? Often we focus on the industry, but I want to point out that the Article 5.3 guidelines also includes individuals that work to further the interests of the tobacco industry. So it's not just the tobacco industry, but uh, individuals who further their interests. And in this case, I want to uh, point out the harm reduction front groups who have been attacking the COP. Uh, and they are both organizations as well as uh, individuals, and they work to further the interests of the industry. They've been, uh, CAPRA, for example, has been calling on the New Zealand government, uh, you know, to include uh, uh, consumer advocacy participation at COP10. The um, uh, TPA has accused WHO FCTC of ignoring the science and the rights to consumers, KAC, and I think we are going to see KAC in action. Uh, you know, in Panama, they have condemned the exclusion of harm reduction, tobacco harm reduction uh, front groups. Example of Institute for Economic Affair, where the director criticized the WHO stand on a cigarette and described it as fundamentally corrupt and incompetent organization, as well as the word paper alliance. Their community manager said the only reason the WHO has neglected evidence for vaping as a smoking cessation aid is because it has already taken a side in the vaping debate. Just to note that um, the president of Institute of Economic Affairs would be one of the uh, attendees in the good cop and bad cop that was mentioned by Mary. And this is a meeting that will take place in Panama, in Tartu, to the, the cop. It's called, as I said, good cop and bad cop, where all industry allies will be there. And other people. So in addition, we have other criticism about the WHO and the COP. So as I mentioned, the Taxpayer Production Alliance, the Smoke Free Sweden 2023, and the UK or Party Parliamentary Group for Vaping. Just the fact that in December 2023, Parsi told the time that the APPG has called because he had other commitment and no one that took over. And um, I'm pleased to announce at the very end that, um, that all the, the information I mentioned that are more in detail into our interference around COP10 and MOP3 that we launched this morning. So please, please feel free to visit the tobacco ethic page to be able to see more details about the activities around the COP.
Yeah, I struggled uh, about whether or not to include that last bite because the audio was so bad. So I tried to clean it up a little bit, but you know, who the hell cares? Anyhow, they're, they're crazy Machiavellians. I mean, it's unbelievable. So the first person says that individuals who happen to believe that uh, e-cigarettes and safer nicotine products are valued, well, they can't be, you know, if they, if they advocate for that, they're doing that on behalf of the tobacco industry. So like no voice could be applied by an individual even. Yeah, well, she, first she's wrong. I mean, R2500 does not cover individuals. It covers the tobacco industry. That's what it's written for. It's widely misapplied. It basically says that if governments are dealing with the tobacco industry, they have to be transparent about it. That's it. But they've turned it into this weapon that they try and say that governments are not allowed to talk to anyone who makes any representations about something with which the WHO disagrees. I mean, that's just exactly what they're trying to do. And that's what they're doing there. I, I was actually quite pleased to see that because they were making our arguments for us and they were in front of journalists. Thank you very much for making those arguments and putting them in front of journalists because you've done it more, more better than we could have done. Um, on the point of that one, that the University of Bath, yeah, I was rather disappointed with that because I watched that live and it's very difficult to understand. And uh, I was disappointed they took $20 million from Bloomberg Philanthropies to set up that, you know, that tobacco and alcohol research group that she works for and they couldn't even afford to buy a microphone for her. I mean, it was, it's, it's really rather incompetent. And when they talk about furthering the interests of the tobacco industry, well, yeah, exactly. If you've got an advocate who's unpaid you know he might be working uh, fixing roads or an account uh, working in the accounts office but if they then because they use vaping products and they believe in them want to help other people who smoke to switch to these products and says you really should try one of these things it's great it could be really good for your health it worked for me then according to their rules they're furthering the interest of the tobacco industry so therefore they are the tobacco industry i mean it is so absurd and, uh, but this is all they've got left now. They, they, they don't even want to have a debate. They know if they have a debate, they'll lose it. So today they had the bulletin from the uh, Global Alliance for Tobacco Control, which used to be called the Framework Convention Alliance. Now, the way I describe them is they're kind of the fan club of the WHO, FCTC, Secretariat and Bureau. Um, and what they do, they, they provide this bulletin. They're non-governmental organizations and they, they, they they put out bulletin of what's happened. They have different authors. Um, but today's bulletin had four paragraphs at the top of a 14 page document saying welcome to COP10. But the entirety of the rest of the document was just talking about uh, sinister forces, uh, tobacco in industry interference, talking about how, why they can't allow Interpol into, into, uh, into their sessions. The entire thing was that, nothing else. They didn't talk about what they would be discussing in the in the conference today. They didn't talk about anything else except trying to smear anyone who would disagree with them. So that's all they've got left. And, that, and that's all that video was about. It was just trying to smear anyone. They know people are going to be disagreeing with them because they know they're wrong. Yeah. So, you know, and what they're trying to do is say, don't listen to these people. Don't listen to their arguments. Just listen to us. And, and it's really quite pathetic and childish. And it just shows they haven't got any arguments left. They, they know they're wrong. I don't know how they sleep at night, to be honest, because they can't possibly believe the things they're saying. And today we had, or yesterday we had, uh, Rudiger Kretsch from the WHO, who was saying the stuff that they have generally kept quiet until now. He said, uh, well-being society relies on having a nicotine and tobacco free society. So now, they're coming out and saying what we've already known is a battle against nicotine. And what he's saying there is completely wrong when it comes to the, the, the meeting that he's at, because you're talking about the FCTC treaty and that treaty was written and it doesn't say anything about eradicating nicotine. It talks about eradicating tobacco smoke. So he's gone outside the terms of the treaty that is there to, to uh, celebrate and they've just really just showed that, that, that they're only interested really in keeping their funding stream going because they've gone from a situation where they think these products could make us irrelevant. You know, we, our funding will go, our university departments will go, all of the stuff that we, we worked for years to do will go because people are going to do it independently. They don't, don't need our help. So he's trying to turn it into irrelevance, into something which he knows he can't do, eradicate nicotine. And that it will take thousands of years for him to do that. And that just keeps their funding coming. So it's, it's shown really he's being transparent in a way that he doesn't understand. He's being transparent that it's all about their funding and all about money for them. And they have got the 
the chutzpah to actually accuse us of only doing it for the money, which is, it's just upside down. And oh, Brent, be still my beating heart. I mean, they mentioned Taxpayers Protection Alliance, and that's the biggest compliment that we could get is that we're inside their heads. We are living rent free inside the heads of the World Health Organization right now. They're calling us sinister. They're calling all of these things. I'll show you how sinister I am. Listen, I'm just a guy from Philadelphia, man. I started in the taxpayer movement 31 years ago, and I started in the taxpayer movement because taxpayers and consumers weren't being represented at the all levels of government. And that's what I'm doing 31 years later, is that consumers and taxpayers aren't being represented. And to see the frustration coming out of the World Health Organization is glorious. It's glorious to see that we've gotten under their skin and that they are thinking about us. I mean, to mention us in a webinar, that's how far we've gotten. And this didn't happen at the last COP or previous COPs. And we had a limited presence at those. But I got to tell you, after hearing this, I'm already planning for the next COP. You know, we're going to be at the at the next one. I mean, if this is how far inside their heads we are. And, you know, Martin mentioned something that's really important. And it's getting away from the treaty. This is mission creep. This is classic mission creep by a bureaucracy. We see this in the United States where our agencies are supposed to do one thing and a few years later they're doing a thousand things, right? Because they have to justify their mission, but also the growth of their budget, the growth of the bureaucracy. And that's what I see here with the World Health Organization is that they can't just abide by the treaty. They have to put their tentacles out and grow the bureaucracy. So what they're doing is justifying the, the expanding budget. And I'm really concerned that this is really going to spiral out of control for taxpayers. And you know about the tobacco industry, I don't care about the tobacco industry. I really don't. I care about the people that are trying to quit smoking. And if someone, you know, in the United States or anywhere else in this world is sitting there, you know, smoking one cigarette after another, and there is an off ramp to this. If there is a product, do you think they care if it's a big tobacco company or if it's a mom and pop vape shop? Do you think they care who is selling them that product to make their lives better in this? fixation on one industry is just outrageous and and, and that listen the tobacco industry is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination right but they are providing products mom and pop vape shops are doing this and the who is trying to shut all of this down because they have a political agenda they don't have a scientific agenda they have a political agenda so this is political science at its worst I totally agree, and I think uh, we'll talk a bit more tomorrow about this. Um, but it's not just nicotine. They're, they're actually coming after alcohol already, too, as well. So it just seems that these controllers uh, are very totalitarian in nature, and basically they've got a real problem with pleasure because a ple pleasure is an individual thing. It's something that the state or the the bureaucracy can't manage, and it seems to me that that's what's bump, you know bumping up against this. Now, Martin, uh, Doctor, uh, I believe, what did you say his name was from um, the WHO? Uh, Rudiger Kretsch. Rudiger Kretsch. He's the director of the Department of Health Promotion of WHO. We have uh, a clip of him from yesterday's opening session of COP10. Let's have a listen. Today, we gather not only to celebrate the achievements of the WHO FCTC, but also to engage in discussions and decide on strategies and measures that will enable us to unlock full potential. The overarching theme for the FCTC COP10, Together Promoting Healthier Lives, is an extremely important narrative that is not only a priority for WHO general program of work for the next couple of years, it also serves as a good basis for mainstreaming WHO FCTC into various health and development paradigms. We have good news on trends in the prevalence of tobacco use. 
A couple of weeks ago, WHO released the Tobacco Trends Report, revealing continued downward trend in prevalence. 150 countries are successfully reducing tobacco use. While significant progress has been made in recent years, there is no room for complacency as this program is uneven. The moment a government believes it has won the battle against tobacco, the industry seizes the opportunity to manipulate health policies and promote their deadly products. This is an important issue for you to consider. E-cigarettes are the exception to these positive trends. Here, we are increasingly seeing data showing a rapid increase in uptake by children and young people. For this reason, WHO issued a call to action in December 2023, which urges strong, decisive action to prevent the uptake of e-cigarettes based on the growing body of evidence of its use by children and adolescents. We continue to need a health promotion approach to tobacco control. Countering tobacco industry tactics necessitates the successful promotion of health and well-being through complementary and essential approaches, such as health in all policies, whole of government approaches, and whole of society approaches. One key aspect that has been instrumental in the success of the WHO FCTC is that emphasis on multisectoral action. The interconnectedness of health with various sectors such as finance, education and environment underscores the need for a collaborative approach. The WHO Global Framework on Well-Being and Health Promotion outlines that one of the foundations of well-being societies is a strong focus on addressing the main risk factors of non-communicable diseases such as cancers, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes and respiratory diseases. A well-being society has to be a nicotine and tobacco-free society. This is only possible by creating conducive environments for the people, empowering individuals and communities to make informed choices through supportive fiscal and regulatory frameworks that contribute to their overall health and happiness. So in this regard, our Director General of WHO is determined to support tobacco control. And that, my friends, is definitely the bad cop. Mm. Yes, indeed. Indeed. And let me just say, the first part of that speech, I thought this was an excerpt from 1984. I thought this was from the novel 1984. It was double speak. It was triple speak. It was all of that. And then he goes into this tirade, obviously, about tobacco. And, and Martin, this was, just was not based in science. He's talking about children vaping more. In the United States, that's absolutely false. The Centers for Disease Control measures this every year. And our, our fellow Lindsey Stroud looks at the numbers every year. And fewer children are vaping today than they were last year, two years ago, five years ago. He is lying. That is a lie, well, especially in the United States. So there is misinformation that is coming out of the World Health Organization on a real-time basis right now. Yeah, yeah they, go ahead, go ahead, Martin. He said there about um, he wants people to make informed choices, but the WHO is spreading misinformation all over the world and every country in the world, um, along with Bloomberg philanthropies and, and the money that comes streaming from there. And then he talks, he has the goal to talk about, he wants people to make informed choices. Well, they're not providing uh, the science that you can make insu informed choices for. from, from they're, they're, they're just pumping propaganda. And, and then, and like I said, there was that quote, uh, a, well, a well-being society requires it to be a nicotine and tobacco-free society. Um, I mean, he, what's he there talking about that treaty for? Because that's not in the treaty. 
um, it, it's almost like he doesn't know the very treaty that he's meant to be talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's terrible, the misinformation. I mean, it's clear um, how bad it actually really is. And they don't seem to really care about it. You know, there was, interestingly, in a cop's release uh, yesterday following the opening session. So this is, I'm not going to read it all, but it's a Global Tobacco Control Conference opens in Panama. So this is their official press release. Um, and they say in it, Early on, they say, these are becoming a very troubling problem. And they're speaking of emerging nicotine uh, products. So the novel products, which are e-cigarettes. These are, quote, becoming a very troubling problem with an alarming increase in the use of these products by young people. Part of this increase is due to disingenuous tobacco industry messages portraying these products as a replacement for real tobacco control measures. <laughs> well, they're, they're not. I mean, uh, what, they, what they're saying there, again, they're emphasizing young people, and they're saying disingenuous messages. Well, let's talk about the woman that they had a, a speech yesterday from the Netherlands, who came up and said, she said this, she said, e-cigarettes were invented by the tobacco industry because they were losing customers from cigarettes. And um, that's completely untrue. Um, they were invented by a Chinese guy in 2003. Uh, they were pretty primitive. Um, some consumers got hold of them. They're, they're very simple uh, technology, so they would take them into their sheds and build them into something better. This is where we came out with the big mods, you know, and the, the mech mods and, and all the, the squonkers and the drippers and all the things that we, we consumers put together. And then they started having an effect. The tobacco industry just dismissed them. They thought they were a fad until all of a sudden they started seeing lots of people quitting smoking. They thought, oh dear, we're losing our customers here and it wasn't until 2012 in america that lorillard uh the cigarette company lorillard bought the the uh, e-cigarette company blue and that is um hold on nine years after the e-cigarette was invented but this woman from the netherlands came out and said the tobacco industry invented these products um because they were losing customers from cigarettes that's a lie that's a blatant lie now she may believe that if she's been misinformed who's she been misinformed by she's been misinformed by the who so the who is spreading misinformation and lies every time they open their mouths and all they keep saying is any of us like who disagree with them like we're doing now we must be funded by industry now i've been saying this for a long time i've been talking about harm reduction for a long time i i ran a uh, transport company in 2021 when i sold it and i did this in my spare time but for years they were trying to smear me and then they found out i did write, run a transport company um, and there are thousands of people like me who do everyday work nine to five jobs and they advocate for this and they are all been smeared every single one of them has at some point been called a tobacco shill by these people they don't talk to consumers they should talk to consumers if they spoke to consumers they'd realize that they're very very wrong on this subject and if they really cared about tobacco related disease and death they would be talking to consumers and they should change their track they're not interested in doing that so they're not interested in stopping disease and death from tobacco related products and it, it's a sham the whole thing that's going on just a couple of kilometers up the road from us is is a sham and it's all designed to just keep their funding coming and it's an absolute embarrassment i'd be embarrassed to be on their side i'm really glad i'm on our side we are on the side of the angels and we will win the debate in the end and and brent real quickly they mentioned nicotine right and nicotine is not a problem because the the united states food and drug administration years ago approved uh gum patches nicotine gum nicotine patches so the u.s fda has said that nicotine is safe nicotine is is fine now but now they're going after nicotine and you know there are a lot of uses i'm not a scientist and i'm not going to get into the scientific uses but i've read enough to know that uh there are real uses for nicotine and for them to now as martin says you know they, they changed their their target right the it's a moving target for them and and now it's nicotine and guess what next week it's going to be caffeine you know, taking away the cup of coffee in the morning. So I think there's uh, a lot going on at the WHO and, and none of us good what's going on there. Can I just add to that? The World Health Organization lists nicotine as essential medicine because of um, nicotine replacement therapy. Uh, the, the WHO itself, 
advises people to use nicotine outside of cigarettes. And there's Rudiger Kretsch, who, like I said, obviously doesn't understand the FCT treaty, obviously doesn't understand his own organization lists nicotine as an essential medicine. So he wants to eradicate nicotine. Well, get out of that quandary. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I've been covering this now for nine years, and it, it just, I can't believe that it's the same thing over and over and over again. In fact, it's getting worse. It really, truly is. Okay, gentlemen, we've got uh, Mark Oates uh, lined up next for an interview. Um, why don't we work to bring him on, and, uh, and then we'll have you back on for a quick close. So I'm going to kill your mics, and I'm going to move to just a quick promotion for Global Forum on Nicotine right now. All right, everybody. So just wanted to remind you, if you didn't already know, that many of our viewers do know that every second Friday we release an episode of RegWatch on GFN.TV in partnership with the Global Forum on Nicotine and its annual conference on safer nicotine products. And uh, we really love producing this this segment. We get get a chance to go into topics that we don't normally do and talk to people in areas that we don't normally get a chance to talk to. Um, GFN, its annual conference, is coming up again this June 13 to 15 in Warsaw, Poland. And, of course, RegWatch will be there, and uh, hopefully others can join. All right, Mark. Um, say something for me so I know that we've got some audio. Hi, Brent. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you. So why don't you fill our viewers in about who you are? Um, I'll just preface this by um, you represent uh, some of the biggest and best vaping advocacy in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. I'm the director of uh, We Vape, which is a consumer advocacy group. Uh, we've got tens, tens of thousands of members in the UK, and we, we really try and get the story uh, of vapors to their politicians and to, to the public and the media because often it's, it's, it's ignored. And we see that uh, in particular at COP itself where consumer stories are completely pushed aside. Um, I'm also a nicotine pouch user and a snooze user and I have been for a long time. In fact, snooze was uh, the first product I used to help me quit smoking. Uh, and then I added vaping to that because very frustratingly, snooze is illegal in the UK. Yeah, it's, uh, there's roadblocks everywhere, aren't they? Aren't there? And in the UK, one, uh, one of the biggest roadblocks has now been thrown up. What happened in the UK? Well, I think the UK uh, was potentially primed by people that just hate nicotine and are prohibitionists. And the media went crazy. Um, and I definitely spoke to journalists and there's a suggestion that there were maybe PR agencies pushing this line, but there was the moral panic over the children. You know, we saw that in America a few years ago and, and the public have just been on the receiving end of article after article uh, about young people vaping. Now, if you drill down to the numbers, uh, you're actually looking at no more young people using vapes regularly than were smoking, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and the smoking rate for, for people under 18 has actually dropped down dramatically. It's its lowest level ever. So there's some successes in that. Now, I think clearly it's a product that's just for over 18s. So there's a bit of an issue and that's caused by some rogue traders. Um, ultimately, better regulation enforced properly uh, with maybe a licensing system for e-cigarette sellers and bigger fines, people that sell to under 18s would solve the problem. But instead, uh, the government is throwing the baby out with the bathwater and banning uh, disposable vapes. Now, the issue with that is that over the last year on year, we've seen the cigarette market get smaller by about 20%. So clearly, disposable e-cigarettes are having a, a fantastic ability to take people away from smoking combustible cigarettes. So when they go away, there's a risk that people will go back to smoking um, or and they will uh, seek the black market. The black market is already very big on uh, disposable e-cigarettes, but it's just going to grow hugely. So you're going to criminalize a load of adults and ban adults from doing something because some children are already doing something that's already illegal. Yeah. Um, how much of a surprise was this? I mean, I can certainly say in our coverage, probably as early as 2020, you could start to see the uptick. Uh, there was the environmental issue, I think, which was the first that really kind of opened the door 
And then once that door was open, they were able to shove the save the children right, right up, uh, <laughs> right up you, the you know what. Yeah, it's been very frustrating. The environmental issue is, is a problem. And I've spoken to so many vapors and my, I myself have seen these disposable vapes uh, left on the street. And that's very frustrating. There's nothing more I hate than litter. And to see this product, which is life saving, going onto the floor and I knew it was going to cause public backlash. It was so upsetting because I knew lives were at risk. But that is an eminently solvable problem. You know, we can have deposit return schemes. Uh, one vape manufacturer showed me this vape they've come out with, which is much easily, very easily dismantleable, and the battery is a proper battery that you can reuse. And I was thinking, if this comes out, I can start making a power bank for my home with them. And, and you know, like a Tesla power bank, I've seen YouTube videos on how to do it. But it, that was too little too late. And that should have been happening two years ago. And a deposit return scheme, just a pound, you know, everyone would be collecting these and sending them back to the shop. But again, I think this ultimately comes down to the fact that Rishi Sunak doesn't understand the subject. And the prime minister has just decided he, he thinks this might be popular, um, even if it's the wrong thing to do. So, you know, down at COP, I mean, it was, couldn't have been the worst time to have this happen because I would imagine it's talked a lot in the rooms of you know of the of the panels and so forth because i mean if the uk is moving in this direction then it proves that everything the who has been saying about nicotine vaping must be right well what the who have been saying about nicotine vaping is completely wrong and i think we always had an issue with the uk i remember an mp asked uh, the government about cop9 they said, will you take a harm reduction approach to COP9? And the government said, no, we will not. We will, though, tell them about the success of e-cigarettes. And that, for me, showed that they didn't actually understand the reasons why vaping was successful, because of harm reduction, because it's better than smoking. Uh, and fundamentally, they were always supportive of vaping, but they never could see the opportunity for things like Swedish snus. Uh, and heat not burn is another one. So what's next then, obviously, is representing thousands and thousands of consumers of safer nicotine products in the UK. Is there a next step? What can be done? Well, the government are looking at a flavor ban now, restricting to four flavors, uh, menthol, mint, tobacco, and a fruit. Uh, there's talk of another consultation on that. And I'm going to be working to drive as many people as possible to respond to the consultation because it's really important that people affected by this are heard. In the last consultation, they mentioned flavors and 51% of people said that they didn't think they should ban flavors. So that says to me that half the respondents were vapors and the other half were people that don't vape. Um, so in this next consultation, if there is one, if we get another chance, it's important that as many of the 4.5 million vapors respond and are heard. Um, because frankly, you know, I like cola. I like donuts. Um, but apparently, according to um, Rishi Sunak, that's not for adults. That's, that's for kids. Uh, and I, I find it really quite frustrating. Uh, you know, young people go to hospital with issues to do with underage drinking. But our response to that is not ban flavored alcohol for adults. You know, we're not talking about having just drinking methylated spirits because people like a pina colada. Um, so it really, really is important that we respond and uh, we make sure that flavors are available because, you know, people may prefer smoking a cigarette to any of those four flavors and people will die. Well, Mark, it's uh, it's bad news, but uh, you're a great advocate. So best of luck in the UK and let us know if we can help out in any way. Uh, for our viewers, we're going to just go to one more clip. Uh, this is um, Patrick Hedger, who's the executive uh, president, executive director of TPA, and he's got a few words explaining more about what TPA does. And we'll be back in a moment with Martin and David to wrap up. Thanks again, Mark. Thank you, Brent. Tell me, what is it that you do at TPA? So I'm the executive director of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. I oversee all of our policy production, um, the various policy content that we're putting out. I also help to kind of uh, keep the, the philosophical flame that we have of lower taxes, limited government and protection of civil liberties. So how does that all connect with tobacco harm reduction? 
Yeah, so this is an issue where most folks wonder why a group called the Taxpayers Protection Alliance is involved. And I think there are some obvious reasons. One, we are a taxpayer and consumer advocacy group, and ultimately adults should have the freedom to uh, consume these products that uh, can help improve their lives uh, if they are people who smoke and um, they should have access to products that are safer alternatives uh, to deliver nicotine so that they are not getting themselves the health problems that are associated with combustible cigarettes. But on a taxpayer side, um, there is the issue of the fact that smokers around the world are disproportionately of older generations, and they're also disproportionately uh, middle to lower class, uh, which means that these are folks that are disproportionately then on social welfare programs. So if you have people that are stuck, addicted to cigarettes, uh, causing health problems, um, that is creating an enormous burden on the public health system. And it's taking resources that could be used to combat other diseases and other public health problems uh, and diverting them to a problem that we know we can solve uh, or mostly alleviate through increased consumer choice. So this is a really important issue, especially here in the United States, where uh, the social safety net programs uh, related to healthcare, Medicare and Medicaid, are in the hole over the next 75 years to the tune of, we're talking tens of trillions of dollars, which is just an enormous sum of money. We're talking about money that is enormous on the scale of the economy of the planet, let alone the United States. So if we if we don't get our fiscal ship right, on, in, especially in relation to those programs, we're gonna have serious, could have a serious debt crisis on our hands. So we've gotta do everything we can to uh, alleviate the cost burdens of the, of the, the social safety net healthcare programs. So if you're an American taxpayer, but maybe not a smoker, you should still be concerned about this issue. Yeah, absolutely. You should be concerned about this issue because, again, we're diverting a lot of public health resources towards a policy that we know is not working uh, to deal with the problem caused by cigarettes and combustible tobacco. Um, so that's a huge problem there. But you should also be concerned that uh, you and particularly in relation to the World Health Organization and the Conference of the Parties and the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the event that is going to be incurring in Panama, um, that your taxpayer dollars is funding uh, an international organization, an international agency that is shutting out free debate, is shutting out open journalism, um, and is shutting out consumers and taxpayers. Um, so that's really problematic. You have liberal democracies that are funding a UN sub-agency that is not behaving in ways that are consistent with liberal democratic values uh, and respecting the scientific process. Well, you guys are some good people over there at TPA. We, we try to be, and listen, we call balls and strikes, right? We look at good policies and bad policies and we call them out for what they are. That's what we do. So Martin, what's coming up for tomorrow? Uh, we're, we're fully into the panels now. We've introduced all our, uh, our experts uh, one, well, not by one by one exactly, four by four, I suppose, for four, and well, the last panel was five, but we've introduced them all. We've, like I said, I'm really proud of the lineup and uh, and we were all guns blazing. But today was an odd day because there was another um, conference down, going on down the road, which is for Latin American um, consumers. And of course, we've got a lot of those here. So there weren't too many people around, but we put on we put on some some nice sessions today. We had a consumer session, which which I chaired, and then we had a policy session afterwards, which I chaired, and then a science session, which was chaired by Jeff Smith of R Street Institute. And and um, and we've we've got great guests like you just saw Konstantinos earlier. Uh, we've had um, Roberto Sussman, who who was on the final panel as well. We've we've got some great guests coming along. We've had a couple more people arrive today, uh, and it's going to be a full house tomorrow and there's going to be some great some great um discuss discussions going on yeah uh, of course we won't hear anything tomorrow really from from the uh, who because it's all behind closed doors all we get is what is fed to us with the journal and with the bulletin but they have come in quite early this morning which was handy so you could have a good look at them to see what's happening but we look forward because they haven't given these awards yet, but we look forward to seeing who's going to get the Dirty Ashtray Award for, from the GATC and the uh, Orchid Award, which obviously is the, given to the uh, country which has done the most to um, 
lick the boots of the WHO. So hopefully we'll get an idea of how it's going through those awards tomorrow as well. Yeah, and Brent, something that I haven't really discussed with my uh, uh, my teammates yet that I, you know, we have the dirty ashtray that the World Health Organization is giving out. I really want to give an award to countries that are doing good things with vaping. I don't know what it's going to be called. I'm kind of bouncing some things in my head like the Clean Lung Award. Uh, the clean ashtray, something to that effect, because I think what's going to happen is we're going to see countries that go in a different direction. They're going to recognize uh, the value of vaping, of heat not burn, of these alternative products. And I think we really should promote them and we should embrace the countries that are doing uh, the good things. And, you know, as, uh, as Martin said, he introduced a lot of the experts today and it's great to hear them speak. I've seen them on Twitter, on social media. It's great to meet them in person. And these are the most dedicated people I've ever met in my life when it comes to one particular issue. They really are focused and that's why we're here. And I also want to send out an open invitation to every delegate of the World Health Organization. Come on over to the Central Hotel Panama. We're here. We have plenty of space. We have plenty of water and coffee. And if you want to hear the truth, if you want to hear the truth about vaping, about tobacco harm reduction, we are here. And listen, I, I mean that. You know, I'm not just saying that. I mean that genuinely because I would like to sit down with them and discuss the science, the, the consumers, talk to the consumers, because I think that's what needs to happen. I think they're being isolated by the World Health Organization. And I would just like to sit down with them and, and, and drink a beer and say, listen, this is why we're, we're doing what we're doing. And I, I don't think they understand that. I don't think the head of the World Health Organization understands that. I don't think a lot of the delegates do. And I think there needs to be an open exchange of information. And I think we will prevail, that, that our facts and our ideas will prevail. So seriously, there is an open invitation for any delegate to come on over to the hotel and talk with us. Well, I hope that happens. So, all right, guys, gentlemen, this was a great show today and a good day uh, today, too, as well in Panama. Hopefully tomorrow will be just as good or better. And, uh, well, that's it for us. Um, make sure you tune in tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern time for another episode of Good Cop, Bad Cop, the counter-conference to the WHO's COP10. And, man, my blood's boiling.